Hello students, I am Imani Sharma, your UGC Net Educator. In this new YouTube video, we are going to move forward with the concept series that we have associated and linked with Paper 2 English Literature of UGC Net. So, of course, we have tried to cover in the previous classes about the Dhvani theory of Anandabardhan, right? So, Dhvani, we have already covered. Who gave it? Given by Anand Vardhan. Then we had the theory of Vakrokti, which has been given by whom? The theory of Vakrokti has been given by Kuntak, right? And today we are going to cover and talk about Shemendra's theory of Ochitya. Ochitya theory by whom? By Shemendra. Correct? So, of course, these very particular theories are really important. Now, coming back here again, Shemendra's Ochitya theory. What did he talk about? We talked about Dhvani as a suggestive meaning. We talked about the other things of Vakrokti, that how it is an oblique expression, a blurred expression, which somewhere or the other enhances the beauty, enhances the depthness of Dhvani. Right? Now, today we are going to talk about, first of all, Shemendra. And he was an 11th century Sanskrit polymath, an expert, poet, satirist, philosopher, historian, dramatist, translator and an art critic for, from Kashmir. So, he was an 11th century poet, critic, so on and so forth, anything and everything. He studied literature under the foremost teacher of his time, the celebrated Shav philosopher and literary exponent Abhinav Gupta. Who was Abhinav Gupta? Abhinav Gupta was per the person who added on, what? Who added on and gave us the ninth rasa. Shant rasa, which is the ras of calmness. We initially had only what? We initially had only eight rasas. The ninth rasa was added by Abhinav Gupta. And Abhinav Gupta is the person who taught Shemendra. Correct? Now, coming back here again on Oshitya, Dhvani and Vakrokti already told you. Oshitya has been asked as a question in the net examination that what does this theory signify? And the word, the keyword that they use particularly is appropriateness. Correct? So, focus is on maintaining a balance and equilibrium and appropriateness in artistic expression. It says, what does it really mean? It really means that even if you are following, even if you are using certain figures of speech, right, in your poetry, you need to adhere to those very rules, you need to respect those rules, you need to get fixated on those very rules, but also you can be creative. So, you need, you can be creative, but based on the particular rules of the poetry which are provided and hence maintain the appropriateness, the equilibrium, the balance between your creativity and the norms which are already established to write a poetic piece. Hmm? Application of suitable language, imagery, style to the piece of poetry, the principle of propriety. This has been also uh, used as a keyword, propriety, appropriateness and harmony. In the artistic excellence, any piece of poetry you are producing, usme balance rakhna hai. Between creativity and adherence to the established norms. If I am saying that I am going to use alliteration, if I am saying I am going to use metaphor in my piece of poetry, of course, metaphor is not using the word like and as, that is simile. So, you can be creative, but with the rules which are already established. It involves making choices that are appropriate to the content of your poem, to the context of your poem, the background and the intended audience, for the audience for which that particular piece of poetry is intended towards, right, or intended to. 
So, we have different different types of elements of our chitya and we are going to use those elements with the usage of particular examples. So, things are clear to all of us, right? First is rasa. First element of our chitya is rasa, which is emotional flavor. How to balance the emotional flavor? Second, dhvani. Already talked about it in the previous video, the suggestion, right? Third is alakkara, ornamentation, decorativeness. Then vakrokti, oblique expression, the blood expression. Fifth is anukriti, that is mimetic, mimetic representation. For example, we have a chair, Plato's description of a mimesis, right? We have a chair, us chairs se yam alak chairs we are creating, correct? So these are the five elements of what? Five elements of ochitya. Now first example through the element of rasa which is coming under the ochitya, you know, ochitya paradigm, we are going to do it. So first, first, first example of rasa is here. The wounded soldier limbed away, leaving behind a trail of bravery. So of course here, rasa is used courage and pathos. We have used the rasas of courage and pathos. Correct? The verse effectively captures the appropriate emotional flavor as we talk about leaving behind a trail of bravery rather than leaving behind a trail of his, you know, footprints. But we wrote leaving behind a you know, trail of his bravery because he was limping. So, a balance is created between the emotional flavor and of course, Shimendra, talk, Shimendra talks about this very particular balance which is supposed to be maintained. Creating a sense of admiration for the soldier, right? And empathy for the soldier that even if he is limping, he is moving like this, he is not leaving the footprints per se, but he is leaving the bravery that even if he is limping right now, he is still moving forward and he fought really bravely. Correct? Then another example of a rasa, the autumn breeze whispered a melancholic song resonating with the hearts of lovers. So, melancholy and romance, these two rasas are invoked. It effectively captures the appropriate emotional flavor again, talking about the lovers who are not together, evoking a sense of longing and nostalgia. The autumn breeze is having that very whispering a melancholic song for the lovers who are not together, who are nostalgic, who are longing one another. So, the emotional flavor is balanced with the usage of this particular language and it is indirect. Then we have Dhwani, the suggestion, the suggestive meaning through the usage of, we are going to see the verse. Her smile, a silent symphony filled the room with joy. The suggestion of musing in harmony through the imagery of a symphony. This is a suggestive meaning that her smile is really good. Her smile is creating a joyful atmosphere. Correct? So that is one example of Dhwani. Then we have another example of Dhwani. We are going to read it. Her words like gentle rain quenched the parched hearts of the listeners. That she was so calm and those people really needed it. The suggestion of relief and satisfaction through the imagery of gentle rain conveys the appropriateness of her words that she has chosen, the words that she is speaking in providing emotional nourishment to the listeners who were there. That it quenched pyaas bujhadi un logo ki jo sun rahe the because they needed it like a gentle rain. Right? So, her words were really, really, let's just say, providing relief to the people who were listening to her and giving them some kind of hope, some kind of relief as well. Then we have the example of Alankara, the decorativeness, the ornamentation of poetry to enhance its aesthetic experience. So, we are going to read it. Her smile adorned her face like a radiant jewel. So, comparing her smile to a radiant jewel is one example of Alankara. Employs appropriate ornamentation, right? Radiant jewel ke saath we have compared. Enhances the beauty and grace of her smile. We just did not say that her smile was beautiful. That would have been a direct statement. But we also used 
word we use the word like we used simile in alankara to enhance the beauty of to enhance or talk about the beauty of our smile that radiates like a jewel right so that is again which is used in here another example of alankara her eyes sparkles like twinkling stars in the night sky so we are talking about the beauty of her eyes right so comparing her eyes to the twinkling stars which are there at night the verb employs an appropriate ornamentation enhancing the beauty and radiance of her eyes that her eyes are so radiant that they are twinkling they are shining like the stars which are there at the night sky the way they are so bright her eyes are so bright and radiant right so alankara ka example then we have example of vakrokti the oblique the blurred expression the moon wept tears of silver casting a melancholic glow so vakrokti ka matlab kya hota hai indirect expression through the personification and figurative language so vakrokti indirectly means of course as we talked about oblique expression this verse creates a poetic atmosphere evoking a sense of melancholy because the moon is crying and it has been using a word casting a melancholic glow that the moon is really sad so we reading this very particular verse we also get to know that the moon which is so beautiful and pretty it is shining but shining with a melancholic glow a sad glow which means the moon is really sad right through oblique expression next second example of vakrokti the thunderous silence echoed through the empty hall here as well we are having oxymoron thunderous bhi hai silence bhi hai echoed through the empty hall creating an impact through paradoxical so here is a paradoxical statement the thunderous silence echoed through the empty hall how can a silence echo till the time you don't speak your voice won't echo so there is a paradox which is used here the thunderous silence echoed through the empty hall the solemn atmosphere and emphasizes the significance of silence why do we say silence is you know better than words etc correct because it speaks louder hmm then we have anukriti the mimetic expression right the mimesis the let's just say the act etc the painter's brush recreated nature's masterpiece on the canvas so painter's brush recreated nature's scene on the canvas mimetic representation of nature's beauty which means that the painter as i already told you that we have created chair by looking at the image of a chair make looking at the video on youtube how to make a chair so on and so forth same is the case what is the painter doing in here the painter is let's just say painting the mountains right this sun a house i can't really draw theek hai of course so what is the painter doing in here we are drawing certain birds this is the best drawing that i could make right now so of course i am creating a mimetic expression of the nature correct demonstrates the appropriateness of the painter's representation capturing the essence of nature's masterpiece this is not a masterpiece that i have created in here koi bhi bachcha bana lega isko second example is the sculptor's hands are carved carved sorry the sculptor's hands carved life into the lifeless stone because it created such a beautiful sculpture right so it is so beautiful that it looks like it is a thing which is living it is a living thing it is a human mimetic representation of the sculptor's skill demonstrates the appropriateness of sculptor's craftsmanship how he has used his you know art art bringing the stone to life correct so this is the example of anukriti Ochitya guides artists and poets even today that how you are supposed to maintain a balance between the norms which are already there, but on the other hand also use your creativity as a poet. Correct? Balancing creativity with appropriateness, with the propriety which is there, 
influenced various art forms and it is not just used in poetry but literature painting sculpture etc sab mein aachitya use hota hai overall this theory encourages artists particularly to strike a balance between their creativity and appropriateness if you are creating a sculpture which looks like a more you know greek model so of course it should look like that to create the appropriateness there so aesthetically pleasing emotionally resonant and culturally relevant artistic expressions are created correct so all in all or chitya mein we have covered how to create a balance between first of all the keywords which are used for a chitya are appropriateness and you know propriety and of course to create a balance between the creativity that you have as an art uh, have as an artist along with the norms the adherence to the rules and regulations which are already established so we have covered all these very theories which were important from the indian aesthetics purpose right and i hope things were clear if still you have any doubt you can drop that thing in the comment section below and i will reply for sure till the time you all keep on studying i'll see you again thank you so much and have a good day bye bye